I know your imagination has been stirred by the empty trays that will be filled with your lunchtime food. But more food for thought comes first. Um, we're actually going to uh, take a little break from our panel format. Just trying to get a little less noise from the hallway. Um, we're taking a little break from the panel format. Uh, I'm excited to be introducing to you actually the second of our conference's featured speakers, who is Kate Crawford. Um, as our planning for this was coming together, I, I became a little worried that our conference might be, uh, might inadvertently turn into something that would look like an uncritical celebration of a data-centric future. And of course, as academics, we just don't uncritically celebrate anything. Um, it's in the rule book. Uh, but as luck would have it, uh, the New York Times uh, blog alerted me last summer to an interview with a social researcher affiliated with Microsoft Research who seemed to be tackling uh, in just the thoughtful way we needed some of the cautionary issues that I, I also felt um, needed to be addressed with regard to big data. Well, that scholar is Kate Crawford, a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England. She's also a visiting professor at the MIT Center for Civic Media and a senior fellow at the Information Law Institute at NYU. Uh, over the last 10 years, she's researched the social, political, and cultural contexts of networked media technologies. She studies a wide range of data practices, including the ethics of big data, crisis informatics, network journalism, and the everyday patterns of mobile and social media use. She was previously the Deputy Director of Journalism of the, of the Journalism and Media Research Center at the University of New South Wales and a founding member of the Media and Communications Department at the University of Sydney. And uh, her talk today, the last time I saw it, was just called Beyond Positivism, The Myths of Big Data, but it seems to have been transformed into the raw and the cooked mythologies of big data. But please welcome Kate Crawford. Of course, I had to change the title just to keep Peter on his toes. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I'd just like to thank the IS Journal, and particularly Peter Shane, for inviting me to come and join this fantastic conference. Now, many of you are probably familiar with Google Flu Trends, which is seeking to accurately predict how many Americans suffer from flu based on their search data. Well, just last week, Science published a new article based on a study by David Lazar and others that shows just how off the rails Google flu trends has been in predicting flu rates. Despite being praised as one of the poster children of big data, with some claiming that it was actually going to outperform the Center for Disease Control's own data, it had a spectacular misfire last year, essentially overestimating the peak rate of the flu by 130%. This new study actually shows that it's been systematically overshooting for the last three years. Now, they argue that the problem is likely to be tweaks in Google's search algorithm. In other hand, the Google flu engineers say that it's due to the volume of news coverage about the flu, which was skewing their results. Either way, even with enormous amounts of data and all of these engineers and all of these ways to dampen incorrect signals, Google flu trends is still getting it wrong. Or in other words, their algorithms were responding to the data as objective signals of illness without looking at the context, which as we know, is actually a lot harder to get. This is something that David Lazar calls big data hubris. And I tend to prefer to call it big data fundamentalism. It's the fervent belief that correlation is just as good as causation and that with massive data sets and predictive analytics, we get much closer to objective truth. So this is my favorite corrective to that opinion. This is a quote from Jeff Bowker, who said that raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. On the contrary, data should be cooked with care. Well, the reason I love this so much is because it captures the way in which we can sometimes mistakenly understand data as a pre-existing natural resource, something to be mined from databases and customer records like we're pulling oil out of the ground. Instead, what Bowker reminds us of is that data is always in the process of being cooked. It's an object of human design and creativity. 
and we make choices about what constitutes data and how it should be used. And this is something that requires an enormous amount of care and forethought. Balker's words also link us back to the work of the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, and I guess that's probably not a name you're expecting to hear at a big data conference. But here's why. Back in 1964, he wrote a book called The Roar and the Cooked, which was the first volume of his masterwork of cultural anthropology called Mythologies. He conducted a series of anthropological observations of Amero-Indian societies, and he analyzed 167 myths to look at how mythic structures evolve over time in different cultures and what kind of cultural effects they produce. Now, Levi Strauss also considered the job of myths to be a kind of sleight of hand. They create an illusion or a belief that an ir irreconcilable opposition has been resolved. But I think, above all, it's important to think about myths because the stories that we tell ourselves are powerful. They inform our practices, our research, and the way that we see the world. They can also blind us to serious problems. So rather than attempt Levi Strauss's record 167 myths, I'm just going to talk about six emerging myths that we're seeing around big data. And I'm going to consider the way that they might be shaping and in some cases blocking our view. And I think it's also a nice way that I can use our time together here today to map out some of the broad themes in the really interesting research that's occurring in the big data space. So a quick moment for definitions here. The term big data is used everywhere and in so many different contexts now that it's starting to lose its meaning. But Lev Manovich once tried to define big data as data sets that were once so large that they required supercomputers that could now be analyzed on desktops. But this already points to an instability in the term itself. What counts as big? Is it anything that's not small? Part of the problem here, of course, is that measurement is relational and it's historically contingent. What's big data now probably won't be big data in 10 years, let alone 50 years. So instead, we have to look at this broader phenomenon as being essentially socio-technical, as bringing together both the technical side of cloud storage and predictive analytics, along with scientific, political, and social contexts around how we use data. Back in 2011, Dana Boyd and I wrote a paper where we tried to come up with a basic working definition of big data. We ended up settling on three broad themes. The technology, how we maximize computational power and algorithmic accuracy. The analysis, the range of tools and platforms that we use for big data, like MapReduce and Hadoop. And then finally, this idea of mythology, that large data sets would somehow always bring us to greater truth. And it's interesting that in the three years since we wrote this, it's actually the mythological component that's become exponentially more powerful, as so many more industries and public and private sectors keep investing in big data, and we hear so much about the big data hype. But at a deeper level, I think we really are witnessing a particular and quite important kind of epistemological shift, that is, how we understand knowledge itself through big data, rather than just a, a shift in scale or in methodology. So onto the first myth, this idea that somehow big data is a new thing. Well, actually, it's not quite true. If you do some digging in the archives, you'll actually find that the first time the phrase big data was used was more than 15 years ago, back in 1997, in ACM communications proceedings. Then later in 1999, it appeared in some depth in a paper by Steve Bryson, where he was looking at the problem of visualizing data sets, and he wrote this. Very powerful computers are a blessing to many fields of inquiry. They're also a curse. Fast computations spew out massive amounts of data. It's just plain difficult to look at all the numbers. After all, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers, end quote. So I think it's really interesting that even at this very, very early stage in the late 1990s, people were making this distinction between big data and insight. But we can go even earlier than this. Big data has, in fact, a particular type of prehistory. There are several industries that have been dealing with the potentials and problems of massive data sets and predictive analytics. So over the past 50 years, we've seen the use of big data in climate research, and here I'm thinking of the fantastic book by Paula Edwards, A Vast Machine. Also in the financial sector, and Donald McKenzie wrote a book called An Engine, Not a Camera that I think tells the story of that history really well. And then, of course, 
the NSA and GCHQ and all of the intelligence agencies that we know so well, and we've learned a lot more about that in this sort of post-Snowden moment, but also in books like Susan Landau's Surveillance and Security. So embedded in these 20th century industrial prehistories are stories of industries that saw their economic future held in the epistemology of patents in fighting the difficult tensions between data and insight at scale. So big data is not just one industry or one way of doing things. It's actually this diverse set of practices, and it's grounded in the material realities of data and the cooking of data. And while we might be feel that we're facing some new data issues that haven't been considered before, these industries can actually be used as precursors, places where we can learn particular kinds of lessons about what to do and what not to do. So the second myth, that big data is objective. Well, I'm going to share a personal story about this one. Um, about five years ago, I started doing big social data studies of post-crisis environments, like this one. This is Queensland in the north of Australia in 2010, where we were experiencing the worst flooding on record. We basically had a floodplain the size of France. And I was working with a group of scientists to analyse the social and mobile media traces in order to understand people's communication patterns and hopefully to try and help emergency services respond to crises like this. But even back in 2010, we were seeing problems emerge. The majority of tweets were coming from the big cities and not from the small towns where the damage was much, much worse. The data set was inherently biased towards the city's experience of the disaster. And there were privacy implications too about gathering and analysing messages from people during their most vulnerable moments. Then when Hurricane Sandy looked like it was barreling down the east coast of America, a very similar thing happened, except in this case, I got to see it up close and personal because I was living in New York City at the time in Zone A, otherwise known as the Compulsory Evacuation Zone. So as the water started to rise in my street and the power went off in my building, I suddenly became a member of a very illustrious new neighborhood in Manhattan, Sopo, south of power. It was a very, very interesting place to live for a week, let me tell you. Fortunately, uh, my office and all of our servers were located north of that particular line, and they were busily gathering the tweets about Hurricane Sandy, and there was around 25 million that were sent between October 27 and November 1, specifically about Sandy. Now, that represents a really significant data set for crisis informatic researchers and data scientists. But in the studies that have followed, there have been some interesting recurring problems. Just as the SOPO map only shows you Manhattan, similarly, the Twitter data is intensely concentrated in Manhattan itself. This is a, uh, a graph that comes directly from Social Flow, who mapped where all of the tweets were coming from in that large data set. And of course, this kind of makes sense, because Manhattan has very high smartphone ownership and it's a very high percentage of Twitter users, which makes it disproportionately large. But very few messages were originating from the much more severely affected locations, such as Breezy Point, Coney Island, and the Rockaways. And as extended power blackouts drain people's batteries and limit your cellular access, even fewer tweets were available from the worst hit areas. So in fact, there was much more going on outside of the kind of privileged urban experience of Sandy that Twitter data just can't convey, especially in aggregate. And I think it's kind of important in these sorts of contexts to remember that it's still less than 17% of the US who uses Twitter. So we tend to think, oh, everybody's on Twitter, it's a really great data set. It's still a very small percentage of people who are using it. So I think it's critically important that these kinds of inbuilt biases are explicitly noted in big social data studies, or otherwise we end up with these very inaccurate claims when entire subpopulations are not being counted. And I'd also say this is particularly important when we want to use these kinds of studies to direct where we put emergency resources. It's a real problem if the worst hit areas simply aren't being allocated. So to make claims about how data sets reflect the world, we need to ask, where is the data coming from? What are its weaknesses? What are the cognitive biases that we might bring as gatherers of the data and analyzers of the data? And significantly, what are the ethics of using that data? Now, these go beyond mere questions of representativeness. And I was really glad to hear this question of representativeness brought up in the last panel. But these are even bigger issues. And I think, in reality, data always comes from a human context. And this often results in a particular type of skew in who and what the data represents. Another problem is, does your data represent humans at all? 
Well, uh, you probably know that in 2012 we went over that magic line between whether it was more people using the web and actually particularly looking at websites or more non-human entities. And I'm talking specifically here about bots. So interestingly, that was when we got to the 51% mark where more web traffic was non-human. And here we're talking about search engine caching sites, but also scrapers, malware, and spyware. And beyond web traffic, on Twitter it's estimated there are as many as 40 million fake accounts. So when a sentiment study tells you that, well, essentially people look to be saddest on Twitter on Thursday nights, we might want to ask questions about whether those emotions are human or non-human, whether they're being expressed by people or algorithmically generated emotions, and whether bots too might be saddest on Thursday nights. I mean, they might be. We don't know. It's possible. More troublingly, of course, bots are also being used to directly try to influence debates on Twitter. So when somebody's expressing a view that somebody else says, oh, I don't really agree with that politi political opinion, they can actually design several bots to go and respond to that person or attack their beliefs. Now, we're already seeing bots play a larger and larger role in these kinds of ecosystems, and so far that's being very poorly accounted for in these kinds of studies. So the third myth is that big data doesn't discriminate. Well, of course, one of the big promises is that with big data, we'll produce less discrimination because you can conduct an analysis at a mass level and thus avoid group-based forms of discrimination. But we know that big data is being used for exactly this purpose. Big data is not colorblind or genderblind, and particularly in marketing, we can see how it's being used to put people into ever more precise categories. Now, I'm sure many of you know the study that came out from Cambridge University last year, where they built a model based on the likes of 60,000 people on Facebook. And they wanted to use this model to try and predict extremely sensitive information about those people, like their sexual orientation, their religious views, their ethnicity, and even whether they were a drug or alcohol user. And what was really interesting about this study, I thought, was that they were they were best at predicting whether you were Caucasian or African American. They had about 95% success rate. Uh, the next one after that was gender. The next one after that was male sexuality. And then way down the list, at the very bottom of the list, was female sexuality. We are apparently a lot harder to figure out by these kinds of predictive <laughs> models, which I thought was very entertaining. But perhaps less entertaining was the fact that the researchers included a very strong warning at the end of this study to say that this data could be used by employers, by landlords, by governments, to discriminate against people, but without anybody knowing. So historically, the practice of denying or charging more for services like banking, insurance, or healthcare was called redlining. And this was a term that was coined in the 1960s by the sociologist John McKnight when he was studying entrenched discrimination against black urban neighborhoods. But under the much friendlier rubric of personalization, big data can be used to isolate specific social groups and treat them differently, something that laws like the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was designed specifically to prohibit. The difficulty here isn't that big data discriminates. We know that it does. It's that you won't know that you've been discriminated against. So you, know, you won't know that the reason you didn't get that job is because your Facebook likes indicate that occasionally you go down to the pub and you have too many drinks, or that you didn't get that loan because your search history correlates with the sort of person who is a poor credit risk, rightly or wrongly. Another key issue here is predictive policing, which is the way in which we're seeing police groups draw on large-scale models of city data in the hope that they can prevent future crimes. Now, this is happening in, in a large number of cities across the US. However, focusing police activity on particular algorithmically generated hotspots runs the danger of reinforcing particular social groups as pre-criminals and institutionalizing differential policing as standard practice. As one police chief wrote, and this was a guy who'd been working with predictive policing for a few years, he said that even though these predictive policing algorithms were supposed to explicitly avoid categories like race or gender, the practical result of using these systems was, and I quote, a recipe for deteriorating community relations, a perceived lack of procedural justice, accusations of racial profiling, and a threat to police legitimacy. And we just saw an example of this three weeks ago when a story broke about a 22-year-old guy in Chicago who was approached by the police. He'd never had any criminal record, didn't own a gun, 
wasn't under suspicion of any particular crime, but the police went to his house and told him that he was being tracked because he was on a heat list. So we might have some real concerns here about what happens if you wrongly end up on one of these heat lists, or if signals like where you live or who you know produce their own kinds of injustice. So more broadly, these types of predictive heat lists could be just as easily used to deny individuals employment, housing, or any other number of services and opportunities. Simply living near a hotspot could produce particular kinds of social stigma. Finally, where we're seeing a lot of these problems occur is in the area of health data. Now HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, provides some of the strongest privacy protections that we have in the US. But our online behavior can unintentionally reveal so much about our state of health, like when you put in your symptoms into a search engine or you like a disease foundation on Facebook or even if you buy an ebook about cancer survival. When those particular types of data signals are brought together with models, you can actually come up with some pretty interesting predictions about somebody's state of well-being. Now, what's interesting, of course, about those predictions is that they're operating entirely outside of the protections of HIPAA. All of that kind of online data, if it's not being conducted by a doctor or a hospital, that is simply outside of HIPAA's protections. So essentially, data aggregators are performing an end run around HIPAA. Or as the legal scholar Nicholas Terry puts it, bringing HIPAA to big data is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. So the fifth myth is that big data is anonymous. We can anonymize these data sets, and therefore, these kinds of harms can't happen. Well, back in 1930, Edmund Locard was studying how many data points you need to uniquely identify a fingerprint. And he showed that 12 points are all you need to identify somebody's fingerprint. Just 12, and I can tell you which one of you it is. Guess how many points you need to uniquely identify an individual from cell phone metadata? Anybody know? Somewhere between those two. It's actually four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really interesting. It's four spatiotemporal points, which means where you were at a particular time. So and this comes from a paper by Cesar Hildago and others, which they published in Nature. And they found that if they, even if they increased the granularity of the data set, that means blurring exactly what the time was and exactly what the location was, you could still uniquely identify more than 50% of individuals with just three data points. So it can, you, know, you could really say it's somewhere between three and four, so you're kind of half right. So it's actually a really extraordinary study. And the reason why so few points of data are sufficient to identify most people from a supposedly anonymous data set is that human mobility is so unique. There's this recognizable path in the way that we travel through our cities every day, from the house that you live in, the coffee shop you go to, and the place where you work. And there's a path that's very much identified with you. And while many big data providers do their absolute best to de-identify individuals from human subject data sets, the risk of re-identification is very real. And I've been in touch with a group of re-identification researchers in Harvard who are looking at just how easy it is to identify people in publicly released, supposedly anonymous data sets. So meanwhile, computer scientists are pointing out that virtually everything is PII. Arvind Narayan, for example, wrote that any information that distinguishes one person from another can be used to re-identify supposedly anonymous data sets. The legal scholars Dan Solov and Paul Schwartz came to exactly the same conclusion. And they noted that the line between PII, personal identifiable information, and non-PII isn't fixed, and it's depending upon our technology. So therefore, that means today's PII might not be tomorrow's PII and vice versa. Then there's Alessandro Akisti's research, which has shown that people's social security numbers can be predicted based on pieces of public data, like, say, for example, your birth date, which a lot of people just put on Facebook. He was writing how it's possible to predict entirely from public data narrow ranges of values wherein you can actually identify somebody's social security number. So this is, a, again, a very dramatic study, again, and also a very recent one just from last year, and one that shows just how personally identifiable information can be predicted from seemingly innocuous data points you wouldn't normally worry about. And perhaps the all-time classic example of this is, of course, the Target case. Now, as many of you know, Target wanted to develop a model to predict 
which ones of their customers were pregnant. Because, of course, if you can get somebody when they're pregnant and they start buying all their stuff from you, this becomes a very lucrative business opportunity in the long term. So what they found is one of the earliest signals was actually women buying unscented hand lotion, which tends to happen in the end of the second trimester of pregnancy. The next thing was vitamin supplements. Then, closer to the due date, it was hand sanitizers and cotton wool balls. So the downside of all of this was when Target predicted that one of their teenage customers was pregnant and then exposed that information to her family before she had a chance to tell them, causing enormous stress on that particular family in a huge New York Times investigation. So by analysing low-level data traces, predictive analytics can make very educated guesses about what might be PII, essentially imagining your data into being. This also places it completely outside of our current regime of privacy protections. Now, myth five. The big data is going to make our cities smart. Well, actually, big data can provide a whole lot of really valuable insights in terms of how we can improve our cities from a range of things like predicting disease, path, travels, as well as things like improving traffic flow. But it can only take us so far. Because not all data is created or even collected equally, there are some serious methodological issues as well as some ethical issues that I think we should be asking. I'm going to give you an example from my, my research. Um, this comes from Boston, where I'm based. Uh, and Boston has a bit of a pothole problem. So the city decided to release an app called Street Bump, which uses your accelerometer and GPS data. And it uses that to passively monitor the quality of the roads as you drive. So when you hit a bump, it gets reported back, and they know where that was. And they're like, that's probably going to be a pothole. We'll go and fix it. That's a good thing. Where's the problem with this? Well, the problem is that when we rely on smartphones to tell us where potholes are, then we might get a map that looks a little bit like this. This is household median income in Boston, which also maps against very closely to smartphone ownership. For example, we know that as of 2013, if you are in the lower income categories of the US, you're much less likely to have a smartphone. And this is particularly true of older populations, where smartphone penetration is as low as 16%. So if we only use smartphone maps like this to fix our roads, then the wealthy areas with younger people will get more attention, and the poorer areas with older citizens will get fewer resources. So if you're up off the map, I mean, that can mean very bad things for both resource allocation and social equity. It all reminds me of that fantastic line, the map is not the territory. This is Alfred Corbisky in uh, 1948. And I think it helps us explain why big data mapping exercises just represent an idea of the territory, but they always contain their own perspectives. Now, what's been really interesting is that the city of Boston has been thinking about these kinds of problems now, and they're trying to address it by using street bump in council vehicles, which have a much wider spread, as well as police cars. And they also use a phone number that people can call in if they see potholes. But as we move more and more into an era where our devices are passively collecting data on our surroundings, and when these devices become proxies for public needs, we run the risk that existing inequities are going to be further entrenched. So with every big data set, we need to ask, which people are excluded? Who is being privileged in this data set? And how do we know for sure? Here's a different kind of example of city data. So last month, thanks to an investigative piece in the Wall Street Journal, we learned about Turnstile, a company that has now placed hundreds of sensors throughout businesses and streets in Toronto. Now, those sensors are gathering Wi-Fi signals emitted by your phone as it just looks for open Wi-Fi networks. So just out of curiosity, who here has Wi-Fi enabled on their phone? Wow. OK, let's make it easier. Who doesn't? Interesting. So well, I'm curious, why do you choose not to have Wi-Fi on your, on your phone? Because it makes you See, so people are already onto this, which is fantastic. I'd have to say this room is, is probably one of the most well-informed parts of the room. We still have more than 50% of people who have Wi-Fi on. Well, what's really interesting, of course, about this is that it does make you very easy to track. You don't actually need to connect to anything. Those pings are used to uniquely identify your MAC address. And then every time you walk down the street or go to a particular business, you're being tracked longitudinally over time. And so what we learned about Turnstile is that they were tracking people as they went from home to work to a cafe to a restaurant to a yoga class or to a cinema. All of this was happening without people's knowledge. And this data was then being turned into a dashboard that businesses could pay money to access to learn more about their customers. Now, 
the idea here, obviously, is that they're going to use this to tailor particular offers, or in the example that the Wall Street Journal used, an Asian restaurant found out that many of its customers go to the local gym, and so they decided to make workout T-shirts emblazoned with their logo on it. So all of that consentless tracking, all of that infrastructure, because you ate noodles there once. Or, to put it another way, my life is tracked 24-7 by big data marketers, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. <laughs> More seriously though, of course, there are many applications where big data can be applied to produce important efficiencies in smart city systems. But the question we need to ask always is, smarter for whom? In a context where sensor infrastructures are being deployed for en masse ga ga data gathering without people's knowledge or consent, that's just making a city better for marketers, but not for citizens. And these kinds of big data deployments in public space can actually be really disturbing. So I'm sure many of you heard that in January this year, on January 21, Ukrainian protesters were marching in the street against new national laws that were restricting public assembly. On the morning of that day, as they were protesting, everybody at the protest, at the same time, received an identical text message. And it said, Dear subscriber, you are registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. So this is a very different kind of smart city. And I think it shows the range of ways that these infrastructures of phone and sensor tracking can be deployed, depending on who's behind the dashboard. And it might also make you change your mind about how you would express your views in public or join a demonstration about something you care about. And I, I tend to think that's a problem. So the final myth is that with big data, you can always opt out. Well, in truth, so many of the systems that I've discussed today either didn't alert people that they were collecting their data, like Turnstile, or we have companies who sign away their accountability with dodgy terms of service agreements like this one. The great difficulty is that many data companies assume that individuals should just act like businesses, that we trade our information rationally for the best price in a frictionless market where everyone is aware of how our technology is used and how it will be used in future. But this just doesn't map to reality. I mean, I'm sure many of us have that same experience where you'll just agree to a terms of service because you really need to just look at that map right now. Or on the other hand, you just don't have an hour to read through all of the legalese and try and translate what it's actually telling you. Not to mention that, of course, there's a whole class of apps now that don't actually tell you what kind of data they collect. I mean, Jay-Z famously released an app where you could look at his music videos and hear his music, but it was also sucking out all of your contact information as well as things like SMSs. I mean, it was an extraordinary harvester of data without anybody who just downloaded this app having any idea. So I think this is why the reality is that those who are wielding the tools of data and data tracking have far more power and information than those who don't. The scale of the problem now really exceeds the individual. It's essentially a structural issue across our culture. And this is why I think it's time to start moving beyond framing these issues as being about privacy. I think privacy is just too small a lens and it's too individualistic a concept to capture the scale of the shift in our societal practices and norms. And I think this is what many of these big data myths that I've shared with you today are obscuring that there is a massive power asymmetry between the data industries and the rest of us. And when we're deciding how we want to use big data in our societies, we're also deciding what democratic participation should look like. The myth of opting out obscures that in many spaces, be it in workplaces or in cities or online, people are often in a state of forced participation without any real ability to negotiate the terms for themselves. And in many cases, they're not even aware that that data is being collected. So to conclude, I think big data is going to help us solve some of the world's most complex problems. And it's certainly an exciting challenge for researchers like me who are working in industrial research labs with experts in machine learning and information retrieval, but as well as anthropologists and social scientists. Because I think together, the kinds of methodologies we use can hopefully address some of these blind spots that we see, certainly from a methodological side and sometimes also from an ethical side. But these mythologies, if they're going to be ignored or if they're going to be taken at face value, have just as much potential to create new problems or to accentuate old ones. Mythologies guide our practices, but they also obscure the impacts of our work, and they can also shroud inequalities and injustice from our view.
So at the end of his project, Levi Strauss wrote that mythology showed how society is not really a, a set of disconnected individuals, but rather a set of entwined and interrelated social relationships, essentially a social structure. So with big data, we also have to look at the broader social structures at play in order to ensure that we collect and correlate data about human societies, that we don't also end up reinforcing the same power asymmetries between the observers and the observed. Thanks. So I've done my best to, to leave a bit of time for Q&A because I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking about and working on in these kinds of areas. So come up to the mic and we can actually have a discussion. <laughs> you can break the ice, Peter. So I started writing down very fast as soon as you said that privacy is not an adequate frame for this change. Mm -hmm. um, and was your suggestion that we substitute democracy? or what, what, is, what is an appropriate frame? Really good question. Uh, so I've been thinking about this with a legal scholar at NYU called Jason Schultz to try and think of if, if privacy is not working, if all of the kinds of privacy models we have are based on causation, like what caused this particular privacy infringement to occur, and big data is happening in a space of correlation, then we have to come up with different kinds of tools. And what we've been looking at is how we can use due process to think about some of these problems. So that one of the, the big concerns a lot of you will hear is, you know, how do we regulate this space? Do we regulate the collection? Do we regulate the algorithm? These are really hard things to regulate. I mean, how do you prevent somebody from coming up with a predictive model or from experimenting with, with possible ideas around what might be somebody's PII? With something like due process, you can actually put the accountability at the very end of the chain, which we can, we can say, right, what decision did you make? Was somebody negatively impacted? Was somebody actually denied, say, health insurance or housing or a job based on this particular big data model? Now, what's interesting about this is it's, it's a very old system. Due process has been around since the, the 1200s. But at the moment, you just don't have any due process with big data. You'll never know that these big data sets were used to adjudicate something about you. So what we'd really like to see is the way that you could actually ask, OK, I'm applying for this job. Are you going to be using? big data modeling to try and determine who's going to get this job. And if so, you should be able to see that record and actually correct the data if it's wrong. Because as we all know, those of us who work with big data sets, there's always errors. So when that error is the difference between somebody getting housing or getting a job, we need to have some kind of due process structure. So that's where I'm seeing this go. It's a much more flexible idea than something like privacy, which only adheres to, say, a particular type of data, like PII data, or a particular sector, like health. These are, this kind of regulation by silo, I think, is failing in a big data era. And we need these much more flexible ideas, like did somebody actually get harmed? Should they have some form of redress? And so just a quick follow-up. So mm -hmm. to understand, because yep. due process legally is now required only of the government, the yep. suggestion would be that due process concepts be applied legislatively to the private sector? So procedural due process has a history of actually being applied in different non-governmental spaces. And we actually, also the legal scholar Daniel Citron has written about this. And it could be used in a lot of ways in the private sector, it, particularly in areas where something very serious is occurring. So there's only a category where you'd really apply this. It has to be things like housing, health, mm -hmm. employment, for example. If it's advertising, I don't really think you need to have a due process charge. But in these serious areas, I think we really need to bring that to bear on the private sector as well. Thanks. I think there was just a question over here next. Hi, Michael Johnson, University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, you uh, alluded to um, potential for severe inequities in mm -hmm. um, how data are generated and how the data that are generated may be used to provide services um, yep. to different populations. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes me wonder how researchers are, um, how they try to understand the extent to which different populations, members of different groups, may be differentially surveilled yes. by um, organizations or government that have access to their data. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what my intuition should be about how level of knowledge about people's uh, whereabouts or attitudes um, are associated with 
markers like race, ethnicity, or gender. Mm -hmm. um, one might assume that <clears throat> somebody under the um, uh, control of the criminal justice system or someone who is in a hospital yep. would have the highest level of surveillance and the least amount of privacy. Um, but I'm not sure what my intuition should be, and I wonder if you could share some ideas about that. That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad you raised it, uh, because there's some really interesting research coming out about this right now. The person whose work I'm thinking of is Virginia Eubanks, who's looked at exactly this, uh, this question of differential surveillance. And her argument is, if you want to see the future of surveillance, you look to poor communities. And she's been, she did this extraordinary multi-year study of uh, electronic benefits cards, which track you know, every single purchase you make and where it was made and so on. This is, this, is a very, this is a very intrusive, in some ways, data set about everything that you do. And she was talking to these communities and saying, you know, how, how does this affect you? And they were saying, well, look, you know, we, we already know that we get surveilled more than you know, the wealthy areas because we have more police, you know, we get more people knocking on our door in the middle of the night, we, you know, we get harassed in different ways, we have more cameras in our neighbourhood. So we're already seeing that these kinds of surveillance technologies are unevenly distributed. And I think the question that it raised for us as researchers is, does that also mean that the potential harms are going to be unevenly distributed? Because I think they are. I think there's a lot of, a lot of data now that's showing to the fact that it's, it's people who fall on one side of the data model that might have an, a signal that indicates that, oh, you know, you, you don't do well in these particular criteria that can map to particular forms of inequity that are already existing. So, I mean, this is a serious problem, and I think it's what's, what's really interesting is that it, it hasn't been discussed a lot, um, and it's, it's going to be coming up more and more. And we're seeing now a whole range of civil rights groups who are actually now uh, doing a host of events, hosting a series of events, looking specifically at this question. We had the first one last week. So this is, this is I think, now going to be one of the big hot-button issues for this area, is to make sure that we're not seeing a kind of entrenchment of existing forms of inequity. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry to have to um, yeah. uh, say a follow-up, but uh, in, in, in popular discussions of, um, of, of, of bias um, or uh, discrimination or racism, people are often very eager to distinguish between uh, intentional or purposeful bias that yep. we attribute to individual thoughts or actions, mm -hmm. which they disavow, mm -hmm. and uh, structural explanations which uh, most, many people will say in public, they don't buy. Mm -hmm. And yet your uh, explanation uh, speaks very strongly to uh, structural inequalities that can affect uh, the, the way that the society treats different populations. I think that's very powerful. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Well, following up on that, I, mean, I really appreciate your effort to make some sense of this rapidly changing, complex set of phenomena. Um, and I'm just going to throw out some elements of complexity in hopes that you'll have something to say about them. I mean, I'll do my best. <laughs> so, you know, one of the moving, one of the regulatory questions is, so how, how do we have a process in which the possibility of harm is recognized and harms are redressed? Mm -hmm. And do processes one way and, and post hoc remedies, some sort of fiduciary duty ideas and other. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think in practice, because I come from the health side, Yep. There's a huge potential for using large amounts of data to understand the etiology of disease and epidemiology and to do things um, to make it better. But the, the process of using that data is grinding, grindingly slow yes. if, and in many instances grinding to a halt because of um, the, the, the continued myth that there is such a thing as de-identifying data mm -hmm. and the continued, the continued belief that, that sort of prevention is better than redress. I mean, among other things, that's just not possible. You're just not going to be able to use big data in health if you have a model in which you've got to get everybody's permission first or, um, you know, you're going to sort of make sure that there's no possible bad use. And that's also true going to, 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 to the last question. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable that f the first thing that will happen is that you will discover disparities when you look at our society, because they're everywhere. Oh, yeah. So you'll find these disparities. It's very likely the next stage, people are going to say, well, what can we do about them? And some of the things that people want to do will be helpful, and some of them will be intended to be helpful but won't be, and some actually might be sort of malign. Mm -hmm. But it seems that if you, if, if you try and control that by controlling the use of the data in the first place, you will not ever get anywhere. Mm. So I mean, I guess maybe I'm asking how do we, this is, it seems to me to be a risk management problem mm 
and we're very big on the precautionary principle as a management tool in our society, and that seems to be in very strong tension with evolving good ways of using data. Really interesting. I, um, I guess I would, I would question whether we've been very, very cautious in our uses of data. I think many of us have, um, have multiple forms of, of data tracking that we willingly agree to, like carrying a phone or driving a new car, right. which is... Yeah, know, I was sort of talking about in the... We're very the precautionary in the public sector. Okay. Yes. We're pretty right. much laissez-faire in the private sector. Yeah, okay, that, that's, that's an important distinction. So I think the health space is a really interesting one. And what we've been seeing from, from some of the sort of very early anthropological work of talking to people in, in hospitals and in particular care programs is they say, would, would you be interested in donating your data so that we could actually improve the treatments for this particular condition? Most people are incredibly generous, and they're like, yes, have my data. I want more people to be able to learn from what I had to go through, and I think that's fantastic, and I think we then have to come up with extremely powerful forms of encryption and protection around that data and forms of data security that we would apply in, in spaces like health with enormously high degrees of concern because that, that data is extremely sensitive. But I think we should also allow people to be generous, to be part of those things. What concerns me much more are all of these far more diffuse signals that are happening in terms of Facebook likes or ebook purchases or you know RFID uh, tags that are actually connected to your medicine bottles. These kinds of things are being used by a whole range of third-party data brokers to produce particular kinds of assumptions about you. And I'll, I'll give you one example that, um, that just came out recently. We've, we heard about a, a particular health company called Blue Chip Marketing. And what they do is they look at signals like, do you have premium cable? Or do you eat a lot of fast food to try and get induce people to join their drug trials for obesity? So if you have these kinds of things, like you're probably more likely to be obese, we would like you to come and be part of our drug trial. Interestingly, the things that they found that correlated with arthritis were liking cats, listening to jazz, and playing sweepstakes. So if, if you can think about, you know, that's, that's pretty much um, how they're targeting people. And what's really interesting about that, apart from the kind of hilarity of these kinds of models, is that, you know, some of the time they're going to get it right. And some of the time they're going to get it wrong. And if you're just trying to move into these spaces to, to test as many drugs as possible or to make as much money as possible, that's okay because you just don't care about the hits versus the non-hits. But in spaces where it's going to directly affect somebody's life, then those times you get it wrong are actually extremely serious. And I think it's very good to have a high precautionary bar around those kinds of questions. So to some degree, what I'm hearing from some data scientists now, um, and this just came recently from a White House event this week on the, uh, the big data and privacy review that they're conducting, is that they're thinking about, some data scientists are thinking about spaces where we actually need more friction. We actually need to make it more difficult if the data is so sensitive and so important that sometimes we don't want that to flow everywhere. Now, that's, what's interesting about this is that it's, it's almost in direct opposition to the, you know, the open data movement. But I think actually the open data movement is getting very nuanced and very clever about what sets of data we actually do want to have out there, and we do want to make that easier. But there are some sets of data I think we want to make it harder. So that's a long answer to, I think, what is a really complex problem, and, I, and by no means what I claim to have the answer to it, but I think nobody has the answer to it right now, which is why I'm concerned about when people do get too laissez-faire, particularly about health data. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, it's all right. Um, I was looking at this and thinking that is there a little more hope for optimism than... than that's why I went back to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what I was thinking, uh, or at least the thoughts were that, you know, is this a short-term problem versus a very long-term problem that is over a medium or a long-term? Maybe people will adjust. Their, their, their behavior will adjust. So half the people here just said they don't have Wi-Fi because they worry yeah. about being tracking. Maybe five years later when this conference is held again, everybody will say they're not being tracked. Or there would be already a technology, mm -hmm. uh, actually a free app, that will make sure that you cannot be tracked if you don't want it to happen. So, I bet you someone's making that app right, right now. Right now, exactly. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that if there is an effort to, by a lot of these firms to track you, I have a feeling that there is an effort from a lot of firms so that you're not tracked as well. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I, I'm pretty sure that some friction would always exist, but, but I feel a little more optimistic that you know, the, there is power in the market at some level that this gap, that, that this huge asymmetry might actually shrink down a little bit. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I was curious whether what your thoughts are, you know, there is going to be a panel in the afternoon, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But I, I, I was very curious that is there, a, is there a need to be, 
panic a little bit more right now versus, you know, see whether we can have another equilibrium. You know, I'm sure a lot of teenagers already know that if they put something on the Facebook, it'll come back and bite them. Even our politicians probably know by now. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. So I'm just curious, you know, how, how we will adapt yeah. to this new world, both regulatory as well as our behavior, as well as the technologies that are going to come around. Such a great question. And to be clear, I'm actually, this might sound odd, but I'm actually a bit of an optimist in this space. So one of the places that I work uh, is at MIT, where I see people who really want to fix these kind of problems with technology. And that there's a whole lot of things we can do to actually address some of these issues. And I think that is taking care of part of it. But it's actually not taking care of all of it. And this is why I do think it's very much a socio-technical problem, not just something we can fix with tech. Because in actual fact, every time we come up with a technology that can protect people's privacy, there will be another company that will come up with another way to actually gather signals passively or actively to find out more about those people, to try and monetize that. So what we're kind of seeing is a type of arms race. And what worries me about an arms race is that if we ask individuals to always have to be getting the right app, protecting their privacy, thinking about their data, they're always going to lose. If you pitch individuals against states, against large corporations, against entities that third-party data brokers who may not have their best interests at heart, they're just going to lose. So what I'm much more interested in is thinking about how we think about this collectively and what kind of collective forces we can bring to bear on this. And part of that is culture change. And that's why I think it's really important that we have these discussions at conferences like this before we see things like wholesale commitments to smart cities where we instrument all the things. Because in many cases, we're not having the discussion first about, well, what might be some of the downsides? And it's by weighing those things up that I think we get to that gradual development that you're hoping for. I'm actually with you that that's, that's my ideal path. But what's been interesting, having been writing about big data and working in it for the last five years, is that there's been far more of this kind of celebratory over-optimism and very little of the, well, what are some of the problems and how can we address them now? Because we actually have to get to them early before big infrastructures, some of which are enormous physical infrastructures, are installed and people actually haven't had the chance to think about what that might mean for their lives. So it's actually a really timely moment to be having these sorts of discussions, by no means in a panicked sense, but in a very, very grounded, research-led sense around what are the effects of these technologies and how can we mitigate against them, both socially and technically. So I, I've heard about um, uh, a response to customer relationship management called vendor relationship manager, in which consumers are working with companies to try mm -hmm. to uh, control what information is shared and how it's used. I was wondering if you've heard much about that, and if so, do you know, if, is it, is it, being, is it uh, successful? That's not a program that I've looked at, but I think it's a really interesting idea, and I think it's exactly that kind of work of crowdsourcing, what people want to see and how they want their data to be used, that we're going to address some of these power asymmetries. What's been interesting is what I have seen is what uh, groups like Axiom, the uh, data broker, does is that um, they say, look, you can come and look at the data that we've got on you, but in order to look at it, you need to give us your name and your address and your social security number. And I'm like, great, so you're actually getting people to clean up your data for you. That's just fan that's brilliant, it's just brilliant. Um, and I think in these sorts of questions, there's sometimes a bad faith that's occurring, is that if, if your motive is to collect data at all costs and not to think about what might be some of the context around that data and how it might be used, then perhaps you're not really thinking about the interests of people in that data. And this can be a problem that can happen in a range of industries, that we just tend to look at data as just being a set of numbers that we can play with because it's fun and because it's interesting. But I hate, hate to sort of quote Soylent Green here, but, you know, <laughs> data is people. It really is. It has human effects. And that means we need to, to treat it with a little bit of caution, a little bit of care, and, and hopefully just in those kinds of situations, think about creating more of a level playing field where people can have more of a say about how their data is being used. I think if, if that's the direction they're heading in, I think that's a great idea. So I have kind of a two-part question. The first is, is, does this really have to be handled at kind of a policy level rather than at an individual level? Because it seems to me that so much, it's very hard to protect yourself individually other than those of us, I mean, I, I have an emergency only use cell phone, which is never on unless there's an emergency. And I keep the battery out of it and I just, because I, I just don't want to be tracked. But I have, the second part of the question, I have a horrible time explaining this to my students. Yeah. Who, who are, you know, when I try and explain that it's not simply that I'm a Luddite, it's that 
it's that I really see that there are concerns over this, whereas for them, it's so ubiquitous, it's so common, it's so much a part of their lives that they can't understand why you would have a concern over them being tracked. I mean, they're kind of like, why would, why would anybody care mm. if they know who I am or what my data says or if I've got this particular issue? And yeah, okay, maybe the girl who was pregnant was stupid, but I wouldn't be that stupid. You know, yep. those kinds of things. They just, they, they take the individual perspective and I just wonder in our society if it's possible to get at those issues through the, or because we have such this idea of freedom of an individual and we don't want to stick that, or if it really has to be at the policy level that some of these things are dealt with. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really difficult problem and I completely empathize with you know, this, this process of working with students and how you explain these kinds of systems because they're extremely complicated and they're interlocked and data is moving from one space to the other with such ease. How do you even visualize that or explain that to people? One of the things that I think has made that a lot easier, obviously, has actually been the Snowden revelations. The fact that you can say, well, actually, yeah, you can turn your phone off, but actually, no, your, your email is still being tracked. Your, your location is still being tracked in a range of ways. And I think that moment has really shifted a lot of those kinds of discussions. The other thing that I think is really interesting is actually Dana Boyd's work in this space, because she's done a lot of ethnographic research with young people and has shown that actually young people are the most concerned about privacy. They really care about privacy, but they're aware that they're being asked, you know, if they, if they want to stay in touch with their friends, that things like, you know, Facebook actually make a lot of sense. So they, they try to, like, mess with things. They will try to, like, put in, the, you know, their, their incorrect name or not their actual birth date, because it's much more fun to pretend you're 93 than you're 16, for example, um, and, and actually use a whole lot of coded messages, what, you know, she calls it a form of, like, social encryption. And I think that's, that's a really interesting way to think about the way that we're slowly starting to think about the kinds of practices that we're comfortable with in this space. And, and what worries me is that you know, if, we're, if we're just doing this individually, sometimes people do things that, that, that kind of don't make much sense, but they, it makes them feel better. It makes them feel like they're in control of their data. And that's actually telling us something really important, which is that people do want to be in control of their data. And at the moment, there's a lot of systems where they actually don't get that option. And I think that is something which is a policy question, as well as a technology design question, as well as you know, how we actually start to think about this culturally. I still think it's really early days for, for people really understanding how extreme some of these forms of tracking really are and what we're going to do about it. I mean, it's super early days. And what I'm hoping is that we can actually come up with some really positive policy reforms and some really positive ways of thinking about how people can engage so that we don't get to this place where people are like, oh, technology's all bad, it's all terrible, because it's not. I mean, it's fantastic. I, I keep my phone on, I use it all the time. It's essential to the way that I live. And it's, it's a trade-off that you know, I may not be comfortable with. So why aren't there different different ways that we can come up with better policy levers, better technology levers to actually deal with this so that we can have a trusted relationship with the parties that we're dealing with. I think that's, that's, that's the most important thing that we can be asking from both the telco and the technology sectors right now. Yeah, um, you said something about smart cities, which I think was very smart actually. Why aren't we thinking about why we're building smart cities? Mm -hmm. We do have an um, analog for smart cities. Um, right now, we have the interstate highway system in the United States. We built Good this point. highway system through, the, through cities in the United States 50 years ago without thinking, and look what it did to many cities. It devastated the inner city. So, um, and it can't be about efficiency. You may have heard of Jevons' paradox. Jevons' paradox is in something in economics that says that if you increase the efficiency of a system, you actually can increase resource consumption mm -hmm. by lowering cost and increasing demand. Yep. So I guess that's my question for you. you we should think about why we're building smart cities. Why do you think we should be building smart cities? What's the point? I completely agree with you. Um, I think the, the most interesting person writing about this issue at the moment is actually Adam Greenfield, who just wrote a book called Against the Smart City. And he's somebody who used to be head of design for Nokia. He's not a Luddite, he's not a technophobe, but he's been looking at the rollout of the, the massive smart city programs in places like Amsterdam, Barcelona, Songdo, for example and looking at some of the negative impacts of those kinds of programs. I think what's interesting about um, his claim is that the, the reason why we're seeing the rise of smart cities is because people are very afraid of the urban. Smart cities are about controlling what happens in cities, and that's, that's, that's a really nice feeling if you're, if you're worried about, you know, how do we track terrorists, how do we prevent particular types of protests that might be hostile. Smart cities are really great for that. But if you want to ask other questions, like, you know, how do we make people feel, you know, safe and comfortable, that they can do things they want to do in the street without being tracked, then it's a different set of questions. So I think there's a, there's a set of agendas at the moment around the smart city question that could actually be 
disentangled and pulled apart. And we could say, well, what is this system designed to prevent? What is it going to do to actually help this community? We just need to ask some more targeted and specific questions about each system as it's getting built and established in a city. Because some of them are, some of them are actually fantastic, and some of them are incredibly disturbing. Um, and we can, we can talk more about that afterwards, about some of the, uh, some of the programs that I think are, are perhaps not doing it right. But there are actually, there are some really interesting paths I think we can pursue, but this question has to be asked every time. Who is it for? Who is gonna get smarter through this? How does it actually help the communities who live there? Good, thank you. Um, so a lot of the discussion and some of the questions have revolved around inequalities and disparities and who gets represented. And I appreciate your optimism about those issues and about relationships of individuals and communities to states and organizations. Mm -hmm. But even in the most optimistic case, if this is a train that we can't really stop or slow down and can't opt out of, can't get off of, in that most optimistic, sort of in, in the case of greatest equality, greatest democratic participation, greatest datification of the individual as the observer, not just the observed, does that change, does that really change sort of who we are and what it means to be human? So that if, if the answer is to internalize actuarial logics Mm. so that we are the most organized organizational individuals, if that's what full participation in this means, um, is that what you anticipate? I guess what I'd like to hear is, do you anticipate sort of a humanification as individuals participate more, or is it going to be that sort of all consumer and producer surplus goes away because of all the ambiguity and sort of squishiness that has generated social structure up until now is going to be supplanted by a, you know, high resolution, low squish version. So I'd like to hear what you think about that. That is a fantastically big picture question to end with, and I thank you for it. Um, I guess I'd answer it this way. Some of these questions do force us to think about what human subjectivity is going to look like. One of the things that's commonly said is that, uh, and this is people who are, you know, using large data systems or even just using quantified self devices, is that that device actually knows more about you than you do. If I want to think about, you know, where I was this day last year, I probably couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I know my phone can tell you. It's actually tracking, has a little map, it can tell me exactly where I was at this time. So it actually, in some ways, knows more about Kateness than Kate does. So that is a really kind of powerful, subjective shift. What that might also mean, though, and this is, like, I guess, the positive side, is that if we give people the capacity to collect and reflect on their own data, we could actually see some really powerful things happening. And that's, that's a shift that I think is really, again, very early days now. We're kind of seeing it in the um, biometric and health tracking. But I think you're right that there is questions around if we're always going to be quantifying ourselves. What do we lose? What are, are some of those squishy things actually really important? In, in, what are we losing in that particular bargain? I think the things that we're gaining, though, will actually be really profound. And this is particularly true, I think, again, in the health space. The people actually want to reflect on things like you know, their own health data. It actually might help them make different choices. But this is part of a much bigger ecosystem and one that I think we have to consider what happens around the data flows. And again, this is where policy comes into place. I actually don't think we're on a train that can't stop. I think we're on this much more complex, iterative process of a shared ecology that a lot of people in this room are making right now. So we actually get to make decisions and we get to make those decisions collectively. And what I'm hoping is that we weigh both the benefits and the risks when we're actually making those kinds of decisions. But thanks for the question, it was great. What a great note to end on. Uh, please join me in thanking Kate for this great talk. Now, as, as you leave the auditorium, if you turn right, you will find yourself able to get on a lunch line. I would urge you to please bring your food back into the auditorium because uh, 